Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to the keynote session of the Asia Australian time zone of 2021 Connected Learning Summit. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Hanson Jong from Tongyeon Regional University of Education, South Korea. I will be responsible for hosting this keynote speech today. I want to start today by acknowledging that many people today will be meeting on First Nations lands. I would like to invite you to take a moment to acknowledge the First Nations owners where you are, if that is appropriate, and to pay attention to respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging. I'm glad to welcome Dr. Jessa Rosers who will present Indigenous Reflections on Connected Education. Dr. Jessa Rogers is a jury educator, artist, researcher, and board director. She is co-investigator on the project Success Factors for Indigenous PhD candidates and graduates, and the teacher education advisor to Aku Matatuku, uh, an indigenous-led initial teacher education provider in Amotirua, New Zealand. Dr. John Rogers is on the Aboriginal Australian Studies Journal Editors uh, Editorial Advisory Board. She has been a church fellow and a Fulbright Scholar. Based at Harvard University, where she was a fellow in anthropology and with the Harvard University Native American program. She currently holds an honorary fellowship at the Australian National University in Indigenous Studies. I had a privilege to read her keynote speech before as a chair, and I'm sure it will provide tremendous insight in how our indigenous studies could contribute to collective learning, theory, and practice. Please uh, leave your comments, appreciations, and questions in the chat for this page that you can find on the top right of the purple menu, and Jessa could answer some questions after her speech. And now, without further ado, here's our great keynote speaker, Dr. Jessa Rogers. My name is and it is wonderful to be sharing with you today. I am an Aboriginal woman from Australia and before I begin I would like to acknowledge the lands on which we are each meeting today and pay my respects to these sovereign peoples and their elders both past and present. In respectfully positioning myself I am a mother. I have three sons and am married to a Māori Cook Island man through whom I am connected to my large Māori whānau in Aotearoa, New Zealand. They are Ngāti Kofata, Ngāti Rokawa, and Waikato Tainui. The image you see is of my husband and I wearing kurawai on our wedding day, which I will discuss later in this presentation. The other two images are of my eldest son, Eden, on the day of his birth, and wearing our family possum skin cloak at his recent graduation from high school. In beginning, I acknowledge that my understandings of what connectedness means come from my ontology, epistemology, and axiologies as an Indigenous person, and are rooted in relatedness. As sovereign peoples, Indigenous peoples are deeply connected to land, to each other, to all aspects of life. And this understanding extends to our work as educators and researchers, no matter the context. It is from this place that I speak to you today. My family, my children, and my own life story are all important parts of this for me. My work is underpinned by Aboriginal scholar, Karen L. Martin's relatedness theory, 
which speaks to the deep connectedness and relatedness Indigenous peoples have to land in all aspects of the living world. In this space, research and researchers are intimately connected with Indigenous participants and research is seen as a connected part of the relational web that all things are a part of. I will return to this important concept, relatedness, throughout my presentation. Today, I will share limited slides focused on visuals to allow the power of story to be highlighted and the importance of spoken cultures, such as my own, to be the focus. Today, I will be storying with you about my experiences in Indigenous research and education, especially digital photo-based research with Indigenous students. The use of digital technologies has grown rapidly in Australia among Indigenous young people. Over the past few years, several research projects have looked at Indigenous Australian young people's use of digital media. Kral found that the use of digital media has significant implications and cultural implications for Indigenous Australians, providing both possibilities for practising culture and for producing new forms of cultural expression. I am interested in how digital technologies, arts-based research, student-centred approaches and Indigenous research methods and methodologies connect, allowing student voices to be amplified and especially providing Indigenous students with control of the research that concerns them and their experiences. This has been the focus of my work as a previous Indigenous teacher focused on boarding school education. To give context to my research, I will now yarn with you about my own story, which is deeply interwoven with the work I continue to do with my own Aboriginal communities. As a 16-year-old Aboriginal school student, I fell pregnant with my son, Eden, who you see before you, while attending a school on a scholarship. This experience deeply impacted me and caused me at a young age to reflect on equity, access, and what schooling means for different groups of people. It changed my life. But for students, many of whom are in situation, schooling in Australia in many locations becomes impossible, especially for young women. Many Indigenous students currently access ind independent and private schools, in part because in many locations in remote Australia, we have a lack of high, high schooling um, options available, leaving students with little option but to attend um, boarding schools in cities and regional centres, which are a long way from home. Policy and implementation pathways have led to the creation of organisations that administer scholarships for students to attend mostly non-Indigenous sandstone private schools and government funding through a program called AB Study which covers the costs of boarding and travel from remote and regional communities so students can get to major city centres and regional cities. As you can imagine, boarding schools have low numbers of Indigenous students, especially considering that Indigenous Australian people only make up less than 4% of the entire population in Australia. and opportunities that boarding schools present Indigenous students. Back to me, in my early years out of my teaching degree, when I ran an Indigenous student program for over 30 students at a boarding school in Brisbane, in Queensland. These challenges included cultural shock and racism from both students and staff, homesickness, disconnection from culture and community, issues with family and school not seeing eye to eye on expectations for students, including around events such as sorry business or when someone passes away. Students were often caught between wanting to access the perceived opportunities of a city education and the responsibilities that they had at home, including care of elders and younger siblings, as well as extended family. These issues were deeply moving and the relationships I formed with these students and their families drew me to consider research, 
after when I looked for a search specifically focused on Indigenous students attending Australian boarding schools, I could find virtually nothing. One contribution I felt I could make to my Aboriginal community was to explore these issues through meaningful, connected research, and as such, I decided to complete a PhD on this topic. Although it has been years since this experience, today I'm sharing this story with you as it was the time in which I realised the power of combining digital technologies with Indigenous methods of research, and this research has impacted my work since. I also believe this is a powerful learning journey that describes the power of connected learning and research. We as Indigenous peoples have knowledges and ways of being, doing and knowing, which have existed since time immemorial in Australian Indigenous cultures, and ours have existed for at least tens of thousands of years. These deeply connected ways of understanding life were core to how I wanted to approach my research and yarning an Aboriginal way of communicating, sharing stories and knowledge, formed the basis of the method I wanted to use. My journey as an Aboriginal scholar navigating the Western Academy while attending Australia's number one university was a challenge. I was surrounded by non-Indigenous academics who knew almost nothing of Indigenous research methods and methodologies which had actually been growing in popularity around the world, especially after the release of Māori scholar Linda Tuhiwai Smith's seminal text, Decolonising Methodologies, and really since the late 1990s. As many Indigenous scholars have, I educated several supervisors and advisors while constantly having to advocate for my own people's knowledge and knowledges, which were undermined as being invalid renamed using anthropological and ethnographic terms and generally disregarded. Early in my research journey, I was drawn to the power of Karen Martin's relatedness theory as a theoretical underpinning. It made sense to me as an Indigenous person. This theory celebrates the fact that as Indigenous researchers, we have a deep and insightful connection to our participants, that we are in community with one another and that these knowledges are based on the web of life in which we are all connected. The learnings from this kind of research were the ones I wanted to find, and they are the ones that I wanted to give back to my community, not just the students and families I'd worked with as an educator and a teacher, but to the body of literature that in Australian boarding schools. Having trained as a film TV at QUT, I was intrigued by what I had seen in my teaching years. I had noticed Indigenous students were avid users of digital and social media, especially photography. Given our communities are extremely diverse, with over 250 Aboriginal languages and wide distances between our groupings, our photographs literally told stories of a thousand words. I was interested in Western photo-based research methods for this reason, especially photo voice, but this non-Indigenous method did not draw on the principles of Indigenous research and decolonising methodologies in the way I wanted, especially co-control of the data collection, analysis and dissemination processes. Photo voice is described as a qualitative, participatory and visual research method. This method involves participants being given cameras to take photographs on topics relevant to their lives. Participants are interviewed about their images before the visual and qualitative data is analyzed by the researcher. The, the results are discussed with a participant group to check for accuracy and disseminated in a number of ways. Wang, Cash and Powers describe photo voice as a process by which people can identify represent and enhance their community through a specific photographic technique. However, even though it has been described as community-based and participatory research, participants do not, as Catalani and Minkler state, typically share decision-making power on the overall focus of the research. I wondered if there was something, however, 
in the idea of students taking digital photographs and yarning about them in the way our people have for thousands of years that could be developed into a research method where students could own and control from the start to the finish a research project. Yarning enables Aboriginal people to speak openly about their experiences and thoughts, as well as their ideas, while facilitating Indigenous ways of working and sharing knowledge. As Bess Rab and Ngandu explain, when an Aboriginal person says, let's have a yarn, what they are saying is, let's have a talk or a conversation. Aboriginal yarning is a fluid, ongoing process, a moving dialogue interspersed with interjections, interpretations and additions, as described by Gaia, Hayes and Usher. Further, yarning can meander all over the place, like a conversation. Yarning has its own convention and style in the telling of a story and can be messy and challenging. I was also interested in how students could use photographs in their own ways, just as they do on social media, by adding text over stories or snaps and videos. As Indigenous woman, Crystal Summers describes, Indigenous expression of research is always connected to the broader understanding of the process as a whole. Ways of doing, practices and protocols, are pursued based on the values we honour and live by. Our relationships and our personhoods as Indigenous peoples, our ways of being, as Indigenous research, an Indigenous research paradigm, is guided, strengthened by each of its components, which cannot be explicated from one another. Data analysis in an Indigenous research process does not, does not disclude acknowledging spiritual influences and experiences having occurred before, during and after the research process. There is no un uncomplicated conclusion. The knowledge and reflections that are born from the research experience are unbound and intertwined. Storytelling as an Indigenous methodology does not require citations to secure its legitimacy as a reputable source of knowledge. Personal, experiential knowledge is to be respected as a valid form of data expression. As an Indigenous researcher, I feel it is my responsibility to share my story with you. The sharing of a story does not propose to tell the story of an other, rather it aims to respect the relationships I have engaged in. In this thing, yarning, digital photography, the ability for students to edit digital photos all came together in what I termed photo yarn, a method based on photo voice with the replacement of researcher-led interviews with yarning and yarning circles and digital photography open to student editing. Students would not only describe their photographs, forming the basis of the data gathering, but would also analyse and theme their photographs as a collective to determine the major themes. Through the development of photo yarn, students were able to disseminate the major themes and their research findings to the school communities in whatever ways they wished, including school exhibitions of their photographs, projection of quotes that they felt best described their findings, as well as spoken word performances. These student-led exhibitions formed a core part of the dissemination of the research I initially undertook with three boarding schools, two with Aboriginal girls in Australia, and one with Māori girls in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The images you're looking at show some of the student exhibition at the end of the analysis process where students were sharing their findings with their communities. After the exhibitions, this method saw me as researcher outlining the results and the process so that our research might be shared with those it was intended to speak to and become accessible to the broader community, including policymakers. Since my PhD, this work has been presented at conferences around the world, written up in journal articles, book chapters, and educational resources at both national and international levels. In my understanding, the success of this method is in part due to digital photography. It provides students with a way to express their experiences and combined with yarning, a space to give voice to their thoughts. 
one of the main influences on the use of photography in the development of photo yarn was Geismar's work on digital images in Kudawai, the image you saw of the, the cloaks that we were wearing at the start. Kudawai are Māori feather cloaks. Geismar states that complex energy networks can be created in digital photography for Māori with wairua or spiritual energies channeled in Māori relationships as simultaneous links to the past, present and future. Using the example of images as a kurawai, Geismar explains that images of sacred and special objects and moments can actually hold the wairua of these objects or moments themselves. Digital photographs can initiate a complex social network that forges a powerful experience of co-presence. This perspective builds on contemporary theories of digital photography and social media and on Māori worldviews that understand people and things, including images, are interconnected, perpetually drawn into webs of relationship filled with cosmic, spiritual, political and social energy. This concept describes the power of images taken by Indigenous students in my research. The spirit that the student images hold cannot fully be understood without considering what Geismar calls co-presence or connectedness with all spiritual, political, social and cosmic energy of the past, present and future for these people. Using that image of a digital, sorry, using the example of a digital image as a as I explains, Māori cloaks are considered to be great cultural treasures or tānga imbued with ancestral power, mana, spiritual authority, and wairua, spiritual energy. An exploration of the capacities of digital technologies to encode Māori values within new representational and relational frameworks, the question becomes, can you wear a digital cloak? This concept of wearing a digital cloak is such a powerful one. The question being asked is essentially how far relatedness actually travels and whether spiritual connections can be formed through digital pathways in addition, in addition to physical paths. Geismar extends on concepts of visual sovereignty toward what I would label digital sovereignty. That is the use of digital channels to convey and share the qualities that historical and physical objects and moments and stories are imbued with. Geismar recognises that digital communication as channels for social and spiritual relationships have visual components, including through digital images. They're one of a broader field, not simply representational, but of co-presence. Acknowledging digital photographs as being able to create these pathways for spiritual co-presence across places across time and across space, they are not simply captures of moments, but act as windows to co-presence, bringing the viewer and photographer and the moments alongside the spirit within that moment or object in the photograph connects across time, place and space. Māori theories of digital images use relational and translational qualities of digital media to formulate and represent a worldview that links the material with the immaterial, the past and the present, not simply as an image of it, but with the photographer and viewer also acting as active participants. This yarn illustrates how I came to understand that photographs allow the weaving of stories, futures, pasts, experiences into the present, connecting people and places with objects across time and space, known in Te Reo Māori as wā, which is a word for both time and or space. This one word demonstrating the deep connectedness Indigenous peoples have and see in our natural world between deep knowledges and concepts. Strathman states that by visually recording their own educational experiences through photography, marginalised students can subvert otherwise oppressive institutions and claim parts of it for themselves. 
they create counter archive document, documenting their visual sovereignty. Students are acutely aware of their contemporary identities that they are projecting. Indigenous students through photography represent vibrant and contemporary native cultures, dynamically reconfiguring their indigenous identities and embracing modernity and mainstream culture on their own terms. As Ricard states, all photographs made by Indigenous makers are the documentation of our sovereignty. The images are all connected, circling in ever sprawling spirals, the terms of our experiences as human beings, hooking memories through time. An important aspect of visual heritage, the connections that create a dynamic, tangible link between the past, present and future. This makes digital photography such an ideal method to include in research with Indigenous peoples. The power of the digital image is also easily able to be manipulated to allow the photographer power over the message and meaning they wish to convey. I will now return to our Photo Yarn project and I would like to share some images with you students chose that they felt give the best understanding of the power of these messages. This is an old wheel. Here we are, institutional. It feels like we're assimilating and stuff. But recently, you've seen people going back to natural remedies and traditional healers in Australia. It's kind of like with the stolen generation. They were making us assimilate into the white society. But recently, you see the backpedalling, people trying to get culture back. And the wheel is also man-made, ignoring nature, but eventually nature overpowers. You can see it with our environment and stuff. We have fake grass here at school, but plants are starting to grow through it, weeds coming through. It's like my personal history. This is a house, not a home. It's a house. I saved it as asylum in my phone contact list. Why is there bars on the windows? It feels like jail. I did this one to show people thinking that we're different, like you can feel it. If you're Aboriginal, you feel the difference of being a black kid to a white kid. From the teachers to the students, you can just tell that everyone looks at you differently. And it's a hard thing. Being an Indigenous girl at this school, you feel like you stand out. I don't know. You can't really express your culture or nothing. I get up and talk about it because my teachers ask me to, but girls don't want to listen. This is my culture. Why don't they pay respect? Sometimes it feels like this school has blurred things, put a filter on things. You see the outside world differently, look at people different. You think differently. It changed the way I see things outside of school. I saw that and I thought of the stolen generation, how they were trying to kill out Indigenous people, making the people, trying to make us white. But see that little black part in the middle? No matter how much you try to make us white, there will always be the part that is black. Racism here, it's not a major thing, but it's here and you can't really escape it. We feel good about being Aboriginal, even though sometimes they make us feel bad about our scholarships and say we're here for free. We aren't here for them. We are here to do our people proud. Being a part of this project brought us together. You can't win because if you go home for culture, you'll be missing school, which is hard to catch up. They keep calling mum and not respecting our cultural business. And that makes mum angry. Then she hates on school. Then when you come back, school seems angry at you and keep asking where you were and why you're away for so long. Yeah. And if you don't go home for sorry business, it's horrible. 
You're so sad and down, and everyone can see. You're crying all the time. You feel so alone. It makes you feel like you're going crazy. You just want to run away. But sometimes school won't let you go back. Then mum gets angry because she says, school doesn't own me. I should be able to leave and go when I want to. But sorry business takes a long time, so I can't always go. And then if I did go, I couldn't go for all of it, which isn't right. The outside of the tree has a solid appearance. But on the inside, it's kind of rotting away. Away, it's how you feel when you're going through a rough time at boarding, when family members have died and stuff, when you could go home, but you've made the decision to stay and not fall behind, so you just have to carry on like you're okay, even though you're not. It feels like you're letting part of your cultural identity go when you do stuff like that. Before I started this term, my great-grandmother just passed away just before I had to leave. I was in senior production, I had rehearsals, and my report card wasn't that great last semester. I was on the plane thinking, what if I keep making these decisions, not participating in culture and that probably won't be a part of me anymore. I hope these images and direct quotes illustrate the power of a simple image, mostly taken by students on camera phones, to act as tools for discussion. The images held power to bring forth thoughts on past, present and future, interweaving those personal stories, histories, ideas, concepts such as racism and reflections on their motivation, all through a single image. Students took up to 15 images each, and as such, there were incredible stories and moments that were shared by these girls. The connections between the images, even across schools, were also quite incredible and reminded me of the deep connection we have as Indigenous peoples, even uh, internationally, not only through shared land, blood, culture, but also our shared experiences of contemporary life as Indigenous peoples and our engagement with structural and systemic racism, and especially the, the painful impact history has had on our peoples. These painful moments in Aboriginal history seem to exist in the, in the present during some of the yarns with students in Australia, with girls, as you heard, speaking about things, including the stolen generations, which was the forced removal of Indigenous children to residential institutions run by religious and government organisations and colonisation, often events which happened well before their birth. This showed a different conceptualization of past, present time. As Janka and Bullen state, Aboriginal people may not see the importance of being able to separate past and present on a longitudinal calendar axis and instead would rather use an event time orientation framework culturally relevant and socially sanctioned. The ability of digital photographs and the yarns that surrounded them allowed for our yarns to take those journeys from past, present and into the future, acting as that spiritual and cultural link to any topic students felt relevant in the context of the discussion. This is the power of digital image and of yarning. The yarning process in photo yarn allowed us as Indigenous women to form relationships as per relatedness theory to drive the research. The power of the yarning circles was not limited to the meaning of the images or personal experiences. Initial yarns across the three sites included discussion and training about research to demystify the process. Learning about research, Indigenous research, and this particular method encouraged students to begin to see themselves as researchers and empowered them as experts in their own lives. With the power to speak up on what they were experiencing, ultimately toward an exhibition in their school, which would give them voice to those who held the power in their lives, as, boarding, as boarders, including school staff, parents, and through broader discussion. The images you see in front of you at the moment are some of the data analysis processes. Some students chose to cut up the transcription into quotes and cut up the images individually. 
placing them with the images and the, the themes that they felt best sat together, while others used post-it notes to write themes that they felt were emerging from the images and the quotes themselves. These processes also included students collectively discussing and deciding which images would appear in their student exhibition and choosing which quotes they wanted to project in the space along with their images, which were printed on board and mounted on tables as per student design. What is needed for student voices to be heard is what Old Father describes as a fundamental shift in the dominant epistemology in our society and our schools to one based on trusting, listening to, and respecting the minds of all participants in schooling. As Seth explains, if students speak, adults must listen. Anti-racist pedagogies emphasize the importance of listening, arguing that teachers can improve their practice by listening closely to what students have to say about their learning, and that listening to students can counter discriminatory and exclusionary tendencies in education. Acknowledging what you don't know is much bigger than what you do know. The notion that the project of school is an ongoing negotiation rather than transmission, the idea that education is a process based on rights and relationships, that education is about change. In closing, as Edwards reminds us, government ideologies worldwide do not consider Indigenous peoples or our ideas key to everyday business. Indigenous people need to powerfully continue to remind others that Eurocentric thought is not the benchmark against which all knowledge and good ideas should be measured. At the same time, we need to provide counter narratives as to what literacies and knowledges count and be the ones to say so. When I began this research, little to no literature existed on Indigenous Australian student views about boarding school. With little research focused on direct student voices attending boarding school, this work still sits within a considerable gap. The greatest contribution of this work outside the student voices was the development of a method that draws on Indigenous ways of conversing and digital ways of storytelling through photographs. An equal relationship between the researcher and participants is key in photo yarn. The strength of the method lies in the understanding that the researcher is equal to those participating in the research and that the participants lead the process on a topic which they want to speak. Stories are important aspects of the research process when working in the space of Indigenous peoples and stories can be told verbally, but also visually through art such as photography. The combination of digital photographs and yarns worked with the students in this study. That being said, issues of student voice are always, of course, influenced by relationship and power. As Alcoff reminds us, who is speaking to whom turns out to be as important for meaning and truth as what is said. In fact, what is said turns out to change according to who is speaking and who is listening. In this research, Indigenous stu school students spoke to me as an Aboriginal researcher and I listened. The result was the development of a new method that allowed Indigenous students to lead research. Since this study, the photo yarn method has been used in various iterations with Native American boarding schools in California using talking circles and with Kanakamali uh, boarding school students in Hawaii using talk story instead of yarning. The ability of this method to be adapted to Indigenous ways of storying and conversation is another strength of the work. This work continues to develop and the method will continue to grow with each group of Indigenous students who take it and use it for their own purposes. It is currently being used in a number of PhD studies, one in Australia and one in New Zealand that I know of, 
And I encourage anyone who is interested in this method to look at how it might benefit Native Indigenous peoples who, to, who choose to use it in research by and for them. This all rests on the connectedness we form as Indigenous peoples working together informed by relatedness theory. These relationships, regrettably, are not really able to be described as meaningfully as I would like, but I feel them. Some connections simply cannot be put into words. That too is the power of image. This journey would not have been possible without the voices of the Indigenous students who walked it with me, or especially the countless Indigenous scholars who walked before me and I thank them and their, all their ancestors and relations. I also thank you for listening to my story today. Yindumara. Thank you very much, Jessa. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this amazing presentation, connecting personal stories with broader theories of cultural identity, sovereignty. Uh, now, Jessa will answer some questions. Um, um, I, I, I don't find any questions in the um, um, chat room. Uh, if you have questions, and then you can leave there. Uh, we have uh, 19 minutes to go. Uh, and um, waiting uh, for, um, oh, yeah, okay. Um, there's a question from Michael Dezwani. Uh, Jessa, can you read that question? I can, I okay. can. Yeah. Um, so I'll just read the question for those that maybe aren't accessing it. Um, Jessa, thank you for an incredibly powerful and informative presentation. The student voices were particularly powerful. Can you speak a little more about how the photo yarn process helped the students to find their voice? What is it about making images that is so powerful, do you think? It's a really great question. Um, I was blown away by how much um, the students took to the idea that they would be taking photographs that would speak to somebody else, particularly about issues they felt were, um, they were quite angry about because they'd had negative some negative experiences, particularly of racism, that they really felt the school was not aware of or wasn't listening to when their voices were raised. And they, they were completely aware of their position of lack of power, um, not just being a very small minority in the school as Indigenous peoples, but also as students in the regular setting of a school where, um, you know, particularly older staff schools, where the school staff and you know leadership hold the power and the students are kind of um, beneath them. So they were excited to hear that the photographs would not just be an expression tool, but would be used to say the messages that they wanted to say. And um, they also were, some of them were nervous about the taking of the photographs because they set up, like one said, I'm not a photographer. And then we had that yarn about how many photographs do you take on a daily basis and how many do you share with a group of people, whether that's on you know, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, like, they said, yeah, but they're not really photographs. They're, you know, just sort of, they didn't see that. I think they were trying to imagine photos as being a particular way of creating art with skill attached to it. And so we talked about the power of an image, whether it's even completely in focus, whether it's got perfect lighting or whether it's about the meaning. Um, and that was where we were getting to, we we're trying to tell stories. And I think using the example of our cultural background of, you know, story being how we learn and share and the, the picture being a part of that rather than some like isolated artifact that needed to be at a certain quality took away some of the nervousness. Um, and I think that was what made these images and creating these particular images powerful. Um, it also provided the scope for younger students. So there were some 13, 12 year old students in the group right through to 18 year olds. So um, some of the older students were also interested in art. So they really went a little bit further with their symbolism and um, you know, some of those more creative ways of using photography to share stories, but using tools that they had access to already. Um, while the younger ones could just take something quite literal and they both worked. So. I think that's the power of it too. It's it's really flexible and open to the the cohort that you're working with. Oh, 
Thank you um, for your inspiring answer. Um, um, while we are waiting for other questions, actually, I have uh, I had a similar question and about digital photo based research you did um, that's called photo voice and digital yarning. And, and I think that a term was really um, great. And what would you think are the main strength and power in terms of allowing students voice to be amplified and especially uh, providing indigenous students with control of research that concerns them and their experiences and linking your term digital sovereignty which i really liked and how would you think this method might be powerful at, for children and young people in general beyond indigenous students in terms of having powers to actively use uh, for uh, these tools for listening uh, and make other people listen to their experiences and have discussions and shedding light on their identities and cultural experiences which their parents, teachers and policymakers might not necessarily understand well and approve. Yeah, 100%. Um, so the method was, of course, based on Indigenous ways of doing things. And um, as we say in Indigenous education, which is like one of my key areas, what works for Indigenous peoples generally works for everyone. You think about, you know, whether it's um, curriculum, pedagogy, what's what works for Indigenous kids actually benefits everybody. It's more about equity. It's more, you know, the access is there. The imbalance of power is, you know, challenged. It's um, anti-racist pedagogies are good for all groups of people because it, it it's about knowledge sharing and growing and understanding. So um, for me, this method is based in Indigenous um, principles and practices. So, and I won't go too long on this topic, but things like reciprocity. So, you know, as a researcher, I come in and I'm asking these people to give up some of their time to be part of a project. What is my contribution to this community? Um, I am not the person that's coming into mine data and use this as a way to, you know, project my career. How am I actually working with these students, their families and the school to have the outcomes that the students really wanted? And so that part of the research is not often captured in Western um, projects because it's not, it's not the core of it. It might be in the ethics application. There might be like a gift card attached or something like that. But we're talking relational and, and it's always based in relationships. So I think the, the photo yarn method would work with non-Indigenous participants, but it's still got to be done that way because to, to have the full benefit of using the method that allows students that co-control, the you know empowerment to speak up on what they want to speak on, the um, ability to learn how to research from start to finish. And I do believe that, you know, my 13 year old participants absolutely learned how to research. They, they knew exactly what they were talking about when they said, this is the analysis phase where, you know, we're gonna disseminate our data like this way. We want to access these groups of people when we disseminate so that our messages are clear to so, so, and so. Um, so all of those things are skills as well. And as I described it to the students, I imagined this is a tool in their dilly bag, like their, um, you know, the bags that we use to carry tools and items. Photo yarn was not about just being part of a process. It was teaching them how to do photo yarn so that they could use it in their own context and capacities. And one of the students went back to her community and said, we've got a particular issue with water. Um, I want to do a photo yarn project with my community and I know exactly how to do it. And that was the greatest outcome for me because that, that's reciprocity, um, you know, sharing something that others can use for their own purposes. Um, that was one way that this project um, stayed true to how we do things as Indigenous peoples. Okay, um, in uh, the chat room, uh, we have Mimi's um, question. So can you see that? Jessa, I'd love to hear more about how you developed relationships with the young people and schools you worked with. I'm sorry if I missed this as a few minutes late. Um, I'm always interested in how scholars develop partnerships to support programs that center on youth and their experiences and voice. It's a really good question. Um, 
even though we were all Indigenous, um, and I'll broaden this out to the other contexts I worked in um, internationally as well, because they probably provide more examples. Aboriginal people, we have a, um, it, it's a natural link. So we, if we don't know each other, we probably know somebody that is related to them or we've worked in someone's community that's related. So we were in the Aboriginal schools um, connected in some ways that built trust. In the Māori context, I am married to a Māori and married into a big, large whānau, so they knew him and or knew of his family, and New Zealand is um, a lot smaller as well, so I already had that um, trust there as well in some ways. But when I went to California and to Hawaii, um, it was not that way because I didn't have those things. And for me, um, I always consider like in my culture uh, a flat structure so we don't have that hierarchy so I interact with my students on a um, very equal basis and I did everything I could to remove the power imbalance everything from meeting in a space where they were comfortable so they chose where we met um, wasn't in a classroom I wasn't standing we were always in a circle sitting down shoulder to shoulder um, I dressed casually I didn't dress professionally I dressed as much like a you know regular normal person that they might talk to on the street. Um, I made sure my language was accessible and spoke to them in ways that made sense to them. I straight away asked them their views, their concerns, um, tried to accommodate any of those things and just expressed to them that that was my intention. So um, making everything really clear about why I was there. There were questions like, why did you choose our school? Um, how did you get into our school when our school doesn't let researchers come in normally? Um, is this information coming to the government and what does that mean for my family? And all of those yarns were way before we started any kind of practice, um, you know, any kind of conversations around what we'd actually be doing because we had to form relationships. So we, we spent a long time yarning about who we are, where we're from, you know, our Aboriginal, in the case of overseas, their groupings, their language groups, their cultural groups, what those things mean to them. Um, they tried to find connections with me, of course, and there were some really interesting ones, like in Hawaii, um, it turned out that someone had Samoan family and my family has people from Samoa married in, and there was a connection there. And that's what we talk about when we say relational, because the first point is how are we connected? not anything along the lines of I'm here to give it like a, a view that's from an outside. It's it's all about being deeply connected and making those connections first. And that's um that's core to Indigenous research really. So yeah. Yeah, yeah and we had a uh, comment from Jackie uh before uh, Michael. Uh can you see Jessup and would you like to make a comment uh, or if Jackie is still here, and uh, would you like to say something more? I uh, I am just seeing. So Jackie has acknowledged um, the lands on which she's meeting, and we that's awesome. And she's also left a link here for us to um, have a look at native land acknowledgement, and it's it's an interesting. Um, development. So in Australia, we do acknowledgement of country because we call our land country in general, not like Australian country as a um, nation. Country is our land. And so we actually do, it's come from welcome to country, which is a traditional practice for us where you wouldn't enter somebody's home without them welcoming you in. You would not just turn up. And so we have always as groups acknowledged other country that might be, you know, we're traveling on or people coming into our country, we would always do a welcome to country ceremony, which would clear any negative and, you know, just show the people welcome, you're welcome, come on in. And so that's developed into this more Western way of doing it, which we call acknowledgement of country when the people from the actual land can't welcome. So anybody can acknowledge the country we're on. So I'll check that link out and, um, yeah, there's some similarities around the world around what acknowledgements are looking like, but I think at the core of it, it's really about, yeah, acknowledging the sovereign peoples of those lands and um, the Indigenous caretakers and and their elders. Yeah, and there is another question from Vera. Um, Can you share examples of the language, the actual words that you use to resonate with students and legitimise their own thinking, their curiosity and their own questions as central in the research? 
Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the words that I would use. So um, I didn't refer to them as participants. So we, they called me the researcher, but they just called me Jessa. Um, and I referred to them in the conversations as my co-researchers. And we tried to minimise in their names, so their, their personal names. Um, we didn't have any kind of participant um, researcher like that, that was removed straight away. Um, they, yeah, they ha they also really wanted at one school to include, they only one of the schools had one Aboriginal staff member at the school, so they really were isolated. But because we were a community, um, they really wanted to include that person in the research conversations as well because they felt like we were like a family and she, obviously being Aboriginal, was welcome to join. So that was amazing as well because she became part of, you know, the conversations just as an observer really, but um, in those yarns we just all interacted in the same way. So I think um, there were there was nothing set. There was no um, semi structure So um, I had my own application very specifically said dining as a process does not have boundaries. It meanders, it flows all over the place. It's a particular yarn on a topic and the topic was what are your experiences um, attending boarding school? And so the, the students knew from that point on there was actually free reign. Like if they wanted to talk about the hat that they took home and somebody took and then the school got angry at them because they lost a piece of uniform. That was on the table. If they wanted to talk about um, something completely separate to a photograph that they'd taken, that was on the table. So the yarns really did flow in the way that that form of research does um, all over the place. Stories about grandparents, stories about ancestors, stories about I saw a star in the sky last night, I heard a bird whistling through my window, I'm scared someone's going to pass away at home. Like these are the yarns that we had and then it was up to the students to determine throughout all of that, look at all the quotes, look at all the photos and say, what do you think the themes are here? Coming back to that initial idea that we were discussing, what do you think the themes are that, that come out of all this work? So it's a very, um, very flexible way of working. And so the, the words, specific words, um, there were really no no words that I can think of off the top of my head, except for obviously using first name basis, um, removing any mention of participants and researcher um, to we're all researchers and we're all on this project together. And at the core of it, we're, we're human beings. We are connected human beings. So we use our names. Um, like, um, uh, are there any resources and procedures that I use uh, that are available for us to look at, like you created like websites or anything, and uh, I just wondered. Yeah, there are. Um, I don't know how I could get a, a group of links to you. Um, you can Google photo yarn and my name, and, and I'm sure you'll come up with some um, publications and you'll see some more images in there and that, but I might, uh, I, can, I can definitely get some links together and maybe put them on Slack if people are on Slack. Yeah. yeah. Or also and you, I, can, you can uh, give the link in this um, uh, chat. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Julie said uh, we can post them on to uh, Cloudo. Great. Okay, uh, we have two minutes. Um, if uh, uh, there is no more questions, uh, now um, we can uh, wrap up this session. So uh, thank you again, Jessa, uh, for answering uh, these four questions and uh, for your great speech. And it was a really pleasure to have you with us. And so this concludes uh, the keynote. And um, if you have more questions, and then you can uh, share uh, them on Slack. Uh, so uh, thank you for all attending. We hope you have enjoyed this session. Thank you. Thank you.